being here with us today. I'm Eleonora Nestola. I'm a lawyer based here in Brussels. I work on digital issue. And I'm the moderator of uh, this great session, uh, Toward Real Safeguard, Data Mining, Profiling, um, Unfair Processing uh, of uh, Personal Data, Data Mining, Targeting, uh, um, Freedom of Expression, Media Pluralism, uh, Access to Information. Those are all the challenges that democracy and digital campaigning, electoral campaigning are facing nowadays. We are here to um, try to look at the different aspects of this problematic and try to identify possible safeguard, measure, or mechanism. Being a very complex issue because it's a multidisciplinary issue that encompasses a number of different legal and policy framework and requires also quite a high level of technicality. We have invited uh, a great panel of experts that have been working on this issue from different perspectives. So, I'm glad to introduce you <laughs> this uh, very great panel. So, from on my left, Josh Nitt. Josh, she is a chef technical officer and senior researcher at the Center for the Analysis of Social Media at Demos, the UK-based think tank. Thank you, Josh. Elda Brogi. Elda is a scientific coordinator at the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom. She's also a member of the Committee of Experts on Media Pluralism at the Council of Europe. She's a lawyer and a professor. Fanny Itveji, <laughs> European policy manager at Assess Now. Assess Now is uh, an international NGO based in Brussels. Uh, working on, on digital rights. She's also worked uh, in Washington at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and she's a lawyer too. <laughs> and uh, uh, last but not least, Claudio Agosti. Claudio is a lead developer for Facebook Tracking Exposed, is founding member and vice president of Hermes Center. So I'm very excited to launch this uh, debate. Uh, I will ask to each panelist to have a short presentation on what you have been working on this topic so far lately. And then I will open up the discussion in the panel. And of course, a Q&A will be devoted uh, uh, at the end of the session, 15 minutes about. So let's start with Josh. Josh Demos was commissioned uh, uh, by the Information Commissioner Office, the UK regulator, data protection regulator, to uh, issue a report on the future of political campaigning. This is really well placed. Um, could you please give us an insight of what, uh, what uh, come from this report and what you believe is particularly important to stress talking about electoral campaigning online? And you can always have this. It's working. Um, so thank you for the for the introduction and, and, and for the invitation. Um, it's been a fantastic day, and I, I actually wanted to thank uh, the organisers for providing probably more hummus in a single bowl than I have ever seen in my entire life at lunch. So that, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I think access to personal data and to inferences derived from that personal data and offered by um, companies like social media companies has completely changed the face of political campaigning. Um, you can see this in the way that campaigns have been active over the last few years. So Dominic Cummings, who never tires of calling himself the architect of um, behind Vote Leave, reckons they run ran one billion targeted adverts on Facebook in the run-up to the um, British uh, referendum on EU membership. The, uh, you can see it in the way that parties are allocating their spending budgets. You can see it in the hires that parties and campaigns are making for data professionals um, and technical experts to help run their campaigns. Um, as um, Eleonora has said, we were asked last year to compile a look at how political campaigning might change over the next two to five years, given advances in um, tech. And they left tech pretty open. We chose to focus on artificial intelligence, uh, data processing capability, and uh, micro-targeting. And I want to raise, it's that short term that I want to concentrate on today, um, and to raise some of the themes and concerns which this research, um, and it was a really enjoyable piece of research, which that um, flagged up. So the first is the basis upon which political targeting and targeting of political advertising is um, underway. At the moment, if you are a political campaign, you have access to a lot of data to supplement your existing, um, the existing information that you hold on voters. One company, L2, offers 
uh, and I quote, um, voter roles which include information on the income, the occupation, the education, the likely marital status, the ethnic and religious identification, the likely primary language, the magazine category subscriptions, the pet ownership, and so on of people on the voter roles. Um, El Toro, a company uh, based in the US, offers the ability for campaigns to find people who are likely to be um, susceptible to their messaging by working out whether they have been at events such as protests or marches or indeed privacy um, day-long seminars and to follow those people home through uh, you know noting which devices have been present uh, at that geolocated fenced area allowing campaigns to follow those people home with advertising and advertise to their other devices over the next two to five years, we expect this ability to become ever more granular and ever more real time. Um, so to take one in, um, advance that we looked at in the report, uh, multimodal sentiment analysis, which is essentially to say cracking the quite difficult problem of analyzing sentiment within text by using other modes of communication. So if you've captured a video or some audio of someone making an utterance, you are probably be gonna be better placed to um, nail the sentiment of that utterance than if you just use the text alone. Um, but you're also going to be well placed to judge the emotion of the person who made that utterance at the time in which it was made. And we expect over the short term campaigns to be able to use things like the emotional state that someone was in to target messaging at them, which could lead to people um, being targeted at their most fragile, their most angry, or at their most disappointed, at their most fearful. Um, the challenge here is not only in working out how this targeting is, how any targeting of political advertising is taking place, um, so not just the basis on which this targeting is taking place, but also the impact which it is having on things like our political discourse. Uh, if everyone in the run-up to a campaign has seen a different set of adverts targeted minutely at them, it is very difficult to have a kind of common political discourse about how that campaign was run, what messaging was shared within it, etc. The second thing I wanted to raise, and it's linked because all of this is linked, um, is the ability to infer data, infer information about voters. Um, we know that artificial intelligence is increasingly able to make quite sophisticated demographic inferences given even very pretty benign seeming data. So there is a good example of um, some MIT um, professors who have recently concluded a study looking at um, metadata about phone calls, so the duration of a call, how often um, cell phone users tended to make a call, and using that to infer gender and likely age of the people who own those phones. General Motors have a, uh, uh, a patent out at the moment, which doesn't mean they're going to do it, but they have a patent out to use vehicle trace data to infer the likely age, gender, and income bracket of someone driving a car. By trace data, I mean how high you like your seats, how warm you like your car, which radio stations you listen to, this kind of thing. Um, this is particularly concerning when combined with um, leaps in deep learning. And the bit of deep learning that I'm interested in here is the ability of algorithms to decide what is interesting about a given input set and to use that to make um, inferences or, or to produce outputs. So it may be the case that a campaign has employed an algorithm that has decided that a particular behavioral pattern is interesting, which might indicate, for example, a religious belief or another protected characteristic. That is being used within the campaign, but the campaign itself is not aware of this, let alone the people who are trying to regulate the way that that campaign is um, conducted. The third um, kind of question I'd like to put out there is around um, generated content, and this is quite forward-looking. Um, so advances in, for example, generative adversarial networks, which is the technology which powers Google's DeepMind, um, may soon enable uh, advertising and campaign messaging to be automatically generated. So the text, the videos, the images which are being used to um, share advertising could in the future be generated by artificial intelligence. This is in its infancy. It is just starting to be picked up by some people in marketing. Um, but if employed and 
If employed, it's likely that it would be much cheaper than employing creatives to do the same job. Again, we may get into a situation where campaigns themselves are not clear on the actual messaging that is being run to the people that they're targeting. Um, this runs the risk of not only campaigns violating um, uh, on campaigning rules and getting away with it, but the larger risk of campaigns violating campaigning rules and getting caught out, of getting found out by people for sharing um, messaging which is considered to be inappropriate, thus potentially eroding trust in democracy. So apologies that lots of that was hypothetical. One more, right, um, I will wrap up, I promise. The, we are going to, I hope, talk about regulators um, in the panel discussion, um, but I just wanted to, to say that this, the challenge that these um, problems pose is a challenge for us to grapple with. It's for civil society, it's for people like Demos, for people like the, um, the panelists and the people in this room um, to decide how we are going to respond to um, the problems that are gonna be generated by technology and what um, informed consent to targeting might look like and what we are prepared to accept as acceptable um, means of targeting. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Elda, you also worked on a study. Uh, it's the study on the use of internet in electoral campaigns at the Council uh, of uh, Europe. So I think that that study tackled some different issue, like similar, but uh, do you see any synergies? Do you see any specific uh, uh, element that you would like to stress here? It, more specifically, you work at the media pluralism, so eventually the role of media and online platform with this regard? Uh, yes, uh, so um, I think that, uh, I mean, the, the study was done, uh, the study um, that we did under the MSI MED uh, Committee of the Council of Europe was uh, a study that, if I'm not mistaken, dates uh, 2017, so ages ago somehow, because uh, in the meanwhile, everything happened. So our goal at the time was uh, to I mean, we were given uh, these uh, tasks from the Council of Europe to write uh, a recommendation on media pluralism and ownership transparency uh, that was uh, having, uh, I mean, was dealing with uh, somehow, with try was trying to tackle the uh, online, uh, uh, the problems that uh, the development of the online media, online information, the spread of online information was uh, uh, creating in the public debate. Uh, then we were asked to, uh, to write a, a, a paper on uh, a report on women and the media and uh, on top of that, uh, this report on uh, internet and uh, electoral campaigns. I mean, it was uh, a, an effort somehow because uh, um, at the time, uh, um, no one somehow, no one was uh, dealing uh, uh, with electoral campaigns, uh, uh, the role of uh, mostly intermediaries in the electoral campaigns. It was uh, somehow a topic that was a taboo because uh, uh, most of um, the, um, the, the doctrine, the, the literature was pointing at these uh, big intermediaries that uh, somehow for us were the elephant in the room, were uh, looking at them as uh, the internet somehow. So they were untouchable. We, we couldn't touch them. We couldn't even think of a regulation on these big uh, companies because uh, somehow they were meant as uh, uh, the internet. In, uh, what we have done with this uh, report, um, actually I must say that uh, the rapporteur of the report is uh, Damien Tambini, uh, but of course we contributed uh, uh, as members of uh, this committee to, to the text and uh, to discuss uh, the, uh, the, the issues that are in the, the report. Um, we tried to analyze first what were the, um, the, the what was the rationale of uh, uh, legacy media electoral campaigns uh, regulation, and uh, we tried to understand uh, uh, what was uh, uh, necessary instead uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the new environment, in the new online media environment, where again these big companies are those that are. 
um, collecting our data, are um, managing them through their algorithms, and they are able to uh, sell um, our attention, are, are able to sell uh, um, to the advertisers uh, the, the attention of uh, the targeted people. I mean, so um, presumably the, the people that are more, have more interest in the content uh, that is uh, proposed. Um, so, I mean, this was uh, our starting point and we tried to analyze uh, what was uh, important, uh, how, what, what kind of principles we should have uh, um, guaranteed, we should have um, uh, as this uh, platform, so what kind of, uh, let's say, rules uh, we should have uh, proposed in order to create some standards that were valid, let's say, for the Council of Europe, uh, um, I mean, at, at the Council of Europe level. Uh, so this was uh, our starting point. Uh, uh, we highlighted uh, some problems, uh, um, the, the fact that uh, um, the debate is, uh, the political debate is polarized, that uh, these uh, big companies uh, are somehow uh, targeting uh, um, the, the messages. Uh, um, so uh, uh, there is the risk of uh, having a polarized uh, audience uh, when, for instance, uh, the um, uh, electoral result uh, is uh, split. Uh, I mean, the, the, the outcome of the electoral uh, campaign uh, is uncertain, whether there is a, a strict margin between the two parts. Uh, we assume that uh, this uh, was uh, uh, a case when um, this uh, uh, targeted uh, advertiser could make the difference, of course. So we uh, had in mind the case of, of Trump, of course, at the time. Uh, I must say that, so, and what we found is, first of all, that there is a big opacity of these uh, companies. Uh, they don't uh, provide uh, any information about uh, how the algorithm works. I mean, uh, the same old story somehow. I don't want to repeat something that probably you have already listened to many times. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, now, after a while, um, everyone uh, has uh, this uh, um, awareness of the fact that uh, uh, there, this situation somehow is problematic. Um, it is difficult, in any case, to uh, try to find, you, you asked me to think of something practical, I mean, something to propose in order to, um, I mean, have, uh, um, suggest something for the new elections, I mean, for the uh, EU elections uh, next May. Well, it's uh, really difficult uh, to find uh, uh, a solution, probably. There is no solution. There is something that we can do probably uh, in the short term, uh, starting from uh, involving uh, um, involving uh, uh, political actors uh, in the debate, uh, ask them uh, to uh, work for a better uh, com political communication. Uh, we have the political parties that we have uh, right now, so it's a, a hard task. But uh, I think that uh, um, self-regulation of uh, uh, political parties should be a measure to be taken into account. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that we can rely too much on the platforms as uh, the European Union is doing uh, right now. Uh, I mean, somehow uh, the policy of the European Union that uh, asks them to have a role uh, when removing or determining what is, uh, uh, I don't know, hate speech, uh, disinformation, so on and so forth, is uh, problematic because it gives them a power, uh, a, an additional power. They already have a lot of power and in the long run they will have uh, more. So uh, in the short term, I, uh, 
I would say that uh, a regulation uh, on electoral campaigns online maybe could uh, uh, foresee uh, measures against political bots, uh, ag um, against uh, uh, targeting uh, that is uh, somehow discriminatory, um, because uh, some, there are studies that say that uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the um, advertising, the political advertising that is targeting a small group of, of people that are um, uh, bombed with uh, uh, messages that are hate speech or are against a specific other um, uh, component, let's say, of the society that is uh, defined by ethnicity, religion, by something that is discriminatory somehow, these make the difference. Uh, this kind of messages make the difference. So uh, what about, uh, for instance, limiting uh, uh, micro-targeting uh, that can be, in brackets, uh, something useful. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's uh, useful in the normal electoral campaigns. I mean, when uh, you receive uh, a normal email from uh, a candidate, uh, you don't complain too much. But, uh, for instance, um, this kind of um, micro-targeting, the micro-targeting done by uh, big companies, when it is, when is uh, discriminatory, when uh, uh, it contains hate speech or um, false information, uh, can be uh, addressed as uh, by, by the we regulation. We will definitely come back on this. Yeah. I have to stop you, and actually, you provide a nice assist to <laughs> to Fanny because uh, with the, with you, Fanny will. Uh, but assist now has been monitoring very closely the what is going on at regulatory level. What are the measures that has been taken at least uh, um, from in Europe, from uh, the European Commission? So uh, what? What's going on at European level and what's your position about? Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Fonny. I'm the European Policy Manager of Access Now. And I'm the generalist, not the specialist on this panel. So I'm very <laughs> humbled by the expertise on this specific topic. I used to be an expert on some areas, but now I'm just doing everything that's in the EU digital. And I'm trying to ensure with my colleagues that EU policies are human rights respecting and user centric. And this is true for this uh, topic as well. Um, but I also serve on the board of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. And myself, my friends, my colleagues are very used to being called terrorists, agents of Soros, all those <laughs> typical um, things you hear from, from the governments these days and some radical right-wing organizations. Um, so first of all, I did not have the chance to try the amazing lunch as I've heard because I was at another event at the EU's official reporting back on this information and the reports from the code of practice. So what I'm going to do today is to give you a little bit of summary of what the EU has been doing, but all of that is publicly available and I don't want to spend your time on just reiterating what the commission is done. But I want to highlight a few things that were said today. So apologies if that part will be a little bit unstructured, but there were some crazy things I've heard today I wanted to share. Yeah, <laughs> and then maybe finally the solutions we propose, we can keep it to the conversation and that's Absolutely. probably better. All right, so uh, the process on the European Union level has started in October 2017, more or less, when the political pressure was big enough to act or to say to do some window dressing in this area. Uh, the Commission created the high-level expert group. Uh, back then it was called uh, Expert Group on Fake News. At least that was changed uh, later and now it's called uh, on disinformation. Uh, there are high-level public officials in the European Union who tend to say that if you want to pretend that you're working on something, create a high-level expert group, <laughs> which is the case, by the way, for artificial intelligence as well, which I'm a happy member of. Um, so they created this group uh, and they did not accept the, the application of a few organizations, including the Freedom of Expression Special Rapporteur of the United Nations, 
or some very specific, uh, David K, or some other groups that are specialized in this field. Um, in, then the next uh, milestone was the 2018 April communication. Uh, where, in which the results of this expert group were published and they identified key ways to fight this information, which I'll, which I'll detail. Then the next milestone in the official framework was the December 2018 action plan, uh, which uh, then distilled to four clear goals what the European Union wants to do. First is uh, improve access to objective and quality information in the European Union, um, empower citizens to actively take part in public debates, um, and uh, to allow informed decision-making processes. And they culminated this work in the signature and publication of the Code of Practice, which includes recommendations for the European elections as well. This was published in September 2018. The Code of Practice, which is the key aspect of what the European Union is not doing on this topic is a voluntary self-regulatory measure. And I'll go into details why it's not even self-regulatory if you ask someone who thinks that word still means something procedurally, but it definitely relies on what uh, two industries, the big platforms, Facebook, um, Facebook Twitter, Google, plus Mozilla signed on to uh, the code of practice on the platform side and the advertisers on the other. But it must be mentioned that none of the brands with their actual companies signed on to it, only trade associations that represent them in the, in the EU. Uh, the, four, the four pillars of this uh, code of practice, and again, this is not something I, I agree with, this is just what the EU claims to achieve with the code of practice. First, uh, better detection of misinformation. Uh, this belongs to the European External Action Service and additional funding for detecting purely Russian um, interference, nothing else. It's not that it's not a problem, but they completely ignore everything else, including any EU member state level government propaganda, which I will come back to at some point. So that's number one, detecting Russian interference. Second, better coordination between member states. This information has no borders. So they set up uh, this rapid alert system between the member states and the European Union. Uh, by the way, the contact points for this has, have not been designated. It will start in March, which might not be timely enough for the election, but that's, that's the status of it. Mm, third, Online platforms and social media and the advertising industry jointly uh, signing on to prioritizing urgent measures in relation to the elections. And finally, awareness raising for citizens. And the silver bullet solution seems to be fact checkers everywhere around, the, at least in this, in this uh, framework. Um, so that's, that's a, a very brief landscape. Uh, and the basic and the basic issues we see uh, is let let me just start with the self regulatory piece. Today we heard from the chair of the expert group, who said that uh, this code of practice, which they are proud of as a first step, they they don't even meet the four basic criteria of self regulation to be effective. Those four criteria are the following: it's not broadly accepted by the main stakeholders because it's limited to those actors who I mentioned. Um, it does not have clear and unambiguous set of objectives. It doesn't provide a clear enough transparent and independent monitoring system. And it definitely doesn't have an effective enforcement system that includes sanctions. Sanctions don't necessarily mean fines, but any, any enforceable uh, measure, yes. So that's, um, those are the key weaknesses of this code of practice. And um, what I want to end with this opening piece is that while Facebook was widely promoting their newly published report, which, was, which happened today, and that's why I can't report back on it because it was just published four hours ago, all of the transparency reports 
as a follow-up action uh, um, for the code of practice. They were promoting it, how much they've done for this space. And in the meantime, ProPublica just issued a new reporting on this maybe last night, which says that um, it's not it's not the same disinformation, but around transparency. It says that uh, there were a number of organizations that developed tools to let the public see exactly how Facebook users are being targeted by advertisement. And it was re uh, revealed that uh, quietly Facebook modified some of the, some of the um, uh, system uh, requirements and these tools, which are called the Who Targets Me tool, is no longer available and that transparency mechanism is at the moment closed off from, from the public to understand. Um, Facebook declined to comment on this issue. On, on the panel, um, the EU representative said that he has not heard of this problem yet. That was today. And one last random thing, because I asked the question about what the EU is planning to do to address government propaganda coming from the EU member states. Um, they said that we should not talk about any specific member state and um, the focus is on online platforms. And what Google responded is that they do recognize the problem. They also see public officials uh, spreading disinformation, but also illegal content like hate speech in the case of Hungary. And no one has reached uh, an adequate solution how to, how to limit how to limit public officials' uh, public statements in this regard. Okay, so the stand of solution seems that you open up <laughs> even more challenges. Um, Claudio, you yeah. have a solution. <laughs> he has an EDI we can claim, test. <laughs> we can claim can you to introduce to us to Alex? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Alex is a project, the name is for Algorithm Exposed. It's a project that has been recently funded by the European Research Council and the first output has been a product that is began two years ago. The product name is Facebook Tracking Exposed. Now, I say it slowly because if you write this on a search engine, you will realize it's also the website, Facebook Tracking Exposed. And it's a technology not different to, to the same approach used by ProPublica or Who Targets Me. So it's a web extension that uh, want to collect what Facebook gives to you. Because the, the point here is uh, keep Facebook accountable on uh, how they make circulate information on, uh, on their platform. Um, so this is the first time in which uh, I have uh, a text written by someone else. <laughs> Despite I'm talking about this project since two years. To the point. To, to the, the point, point, to the point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in theory, this uh, is, um, is the perfect way to deliver it. But <laughs> Anyway, uh, every time you access to Facebook, uh, you get a uh, um, personalized timeline. It's something ephemeral. If you don't take an evidence, you will lose it. And the only way to do a comparison, a uh, sort of uh, uh, confrontation with a friend of yours, a partner, and, uh, um, is to give your mobile phone to the other person, and it's not really viable. Instead, if you keep an evidence, you can try to keep Facebook more accountable, or also to understand how you get targeted by advertising. This was the sub-group of research made by the organization mentioned before. Or to try what Facebook is selecting for you. Because what you're going to see depends on the algorithm. This is a hidden box that uh, Facebook uses to change uh, how the conversation flow inside of the platform. That has been uh, their declaration uh, in 2017 when uh, uh, they promised that uh, they will change the algorithm to make a more meaningful interaction. But what is a meaningful interaction? Like how Facebook algorithm can guess it. So our theory is that uh, we should be more aware on the impact of algorithm. And if we became aware of this, we can also better regulate because we can separate what is algorithm responsibility and what is in the responsibility of the publisher. Otherwise, we are mixing who produce information and who make them circulate. Instead, there are two different um, leverage that can be used. One is a company that pretend to be um, invisible infrastructure that just make your communication disintermediate. And the other are 
people or community or uh, parties that uh, want to uh, spread as much as possible their message. So let me see what I have to say. We use sometimes the reference uh, of uh, uh, Facebook like an individual newspaper, in the sense that uh, the spider is not just something that uh, uh, delivers uh, accurate information, it's something that uh, is personalized. And uh, in the newspaper uh, metaphor, at least uh, you know that uh, there are some newspapers that respect different uh, political agenda, they cover a spectrum. Instead, uh, in, in Facebook, you don't know where you are in the spectrum. You made up your personal timeline, Facebook made it for you. It depends on what you're following, what you're interacting with. A, uh, the kind of approach that uh, we um, promote, as, uh, promote as solution is that if more people do this uh, collection of uh, which are the public posts selected by Facebook to appear in their timeline, they can try to exert a more individual agenda in confronting their perception of the reality with their own friends and try to talk about it, do a sort of, uh, not fact-checking, but at least uh, try to uh, talk with someone who has something in common and understand that uh, if you have a strong opinion about a subject, maybe it's not because you are wrong and the other person is right. It's only because uh, Facebook shows you only one side of the reality. And uh, this can also help journalists who want to do reporting, because uh, in the moment uh, you are collecting uh, data, that uh, we only look at public data, the one shared uh, with the world you can try to understand how the same topic is addressed by different uh, bubbles outside of yours. Otherwise, you have the effect of uh, uh, Manhattan Report that I really don't believe that this Donald Trump will have some success. Uh, instead, uh, you realize that, that uh, the world uh, is, uh, is complex only because you can uh, watch in uh, those other, uh, let's say, bubbles. Mm. We are launching au19.tracking.exposed. In this website, uh, which has only a landing page with a text uh, I've not read, uh, explain uh, what we're going to deliver in the, in the next month. The goal is to offer some services. They are intended to improve algorithm literacy. Because uh, the solution, as, uh, as always, is uh, be educated and understand the complexity and uh, let people make their own minds. But uh, that's uh, happen only in the Barbie world. Instead, uh, in the reality, we have a, a complex scenario where uh, we lack of information, how algorithm works, and uh, how platforms are behaving. So algorithm liter literacy is uh, our uh, main goal. And uh, observing the European election is uh, a trampoline of attention to get uh, people around Europe installing this uh, extension, collecting uh, the aspect of their debates, making analysis, so engaging with the uh, data scientist to understand uh, what is happening in real time uh, during the um, the, the campaign and try to report on what is happening before the election came. And uh, uh, giving some tool that is actionable and useful for uh, uh, voters because they can try to at least compel and put in discussion their own uh, vision without uh, having an algorithm that will tell to you what is right and what is wrong, what is biased, what is fake. But uh, let you check, decide, or uh, evaluate the complexity. Um, one minute. I have one minute. Oh, uh, let me see what can be really interesting to say. He was pushing me for having a bit more time. Ah, we, we, get funded, we get funded uh, by the European Research Council. That's you say. Uh, you say. Oh, that's, uh, they say to me that I have to, to tell so they can take my, me seriously. Ah, yeah, that, that, that's always helpful. And, uh, it's really helpful. We are looking for patterns of different kind. One can be the fact checker because uh, uh, Normally, fact check is uh, applied to what politicians said and what the news media say. But uh, again, if Facebook is a personalized uh, uh, editor of uh, your world, you need to do fact checking on what is more viral. And the only way to see what is more viral is collab collaboratively, collaboratively observe what is happening. In this way, the fact checker can work on uh, what is a current issue. And uh, in theory, again, with this uh, extension, we can uh, highlight if someone saw some information that uh, got uh, some uh, update, some fact check, and uh, give a notification, give something that say, please uh, 
be aware you get exposed to something uh, false, uh, and this is an accurate revision. Okay. That was your minute. One minute. So. That okay. was it. <laughs> thank you. But uh, that's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Claudio. So uh, we have seen a bit like uh, uh, some different elements. Of course, there is like this topic on regulation that eventually won't work. Josh already mentioned the role of the civil society and a sort of empowering of individuals, which can come back also on cer certain elements that Elda uh, explained. I am really open now the discussion topics, but I would like actually you to stress what you think is really missing. So if we want to under identify safeguard, I think that we should find out what is missing at this stage. The first things that comes in your mind and why. I don't know who wants to be the first one. And that Claudia has the microphone. You can pass it to Josh. So this, this is just a, a, a tiny chip in that mountain of, 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 of what's missing. But there's, I think um, you raised a really interesting point with who targets me. Um, and the death of civil society's involvement and user involvement in platforms uh, lies in, you know, is in the gift of platforms themselves to say, well, no, actually, we're going to revoke your API access for this tool. That um, And I, I was using it when it was live. It was a really interesting way of looking at political targeting online. Following on from that, there's a reason that so much research is done into Twitter and into Facebook, because Twitter has been um, actually quite open with the data that allows researchers to collect. There is a, re I mean, it's the same reason that we actually aren't talking about Instagram today and various other platforms which are very much more closed off because we simply don't really know what's happening there because it's not possible for researchers to access it. So I think, I think there is a call that we're always making, but more transparency, more openness um, on behalf Before of platforms. Transparency. Yes, I agree with uh, Josh because uh, I think that uh, what is lacking now is uh, understanding what is really going on, in my opinion. I mean, in order also to um, think of uh, a regulation, I mean, I'm a lawyer by background, so I always think of regulation, it's my bias probably, uh, but uh, uh, in order to think of uh, uh, actions to, to be done, uh, it's uh, even in, in research, I mean, when you uh, read uh, papers on uh, the role of uh, platforms in, uh, in uh, what kind of impact they have on uh, political campaigns, on electoral campaigns, or in general in uh, shaping the public opinion, uh, there are different uh, schools uh, somehow. <laughs> there is uh, who says that uh, there are the filter bubbles, so uh, the, um, the user is less exposed to uh, a plural uh, information, uh, so he or she receives uh, the information that uh, depends uh, depend on the uh, previous uh, um, uh, researchers or uh, the, the data that uh, was provided uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to the platform itself. Uh, so targeted information. There are uh, schools <laughs> that say that uh, uh, instead, in any case, uh, the exposure to uh, the content on the internet is, uh, um, is a choice that uh, a an educated, let's say, uh, user has, and uh, uh, there is more exposure to diverse content than before, than when uh, television was, uh, television and radio were, and the press, the only uh, media um, through which uh, to, uh, I mean, used to, f to form a, an opinion, a political opinion in, in this case. Uh, so uh, it's uh, really missing uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the sense of uh, uh, the reality somehow, the description of the reality. And uh, as uh, uh, he was saying, uh, it's true. I mean, I know a lot of people that are working on Twitter data. I don't know anyone uh, that uh, works on uh, Facebook data because uh, uh, they are not uh, open as uh, the, the Twitter ones. Okay. Uh, so probably, uh, and in this, uh, I sponsor, let's say, more 
regulation. Um, I think that a role for uh, open access, open to, access to the data. Uh, Not only in the enforcement framework, because this, I think, is going to be the second big flaw. Let's say now that the GDPR is in place, it's been very recent, we will look at the way GDPR will be enforced, there are many more actions, so potentially there are spaces for disclosure, but this is, will come from like more the court. So uh, eventually self-regulation or regulation to intervene on this element could be something. Um, and what, what do you think, Fanny, about this? I mean, like what do you have noticed? <laughs> yeah. I have four missing items. They are four very different ones. First of all, the European Union should uh, proceed with the e-privacy regulation and the reform because I know you've been discussing this all day long, but in, in my super top level message, we should not regulate the content, we should regulate how it gets to people and protect against micro-targeting. Um, so that's one, that's a regulatory aspect, and it has to complement the GDPR because the GDPR will not be enough. So that's one. The second, you mentioned the data in two ways of transparency as well. Uh, the transparency reports and also to access for researchers, we must develop adequate criteria for this because yes, they're already banging on transparency and they're claiming that it's better, but we've seen what happened also with the hate speech code of conduct. The information is useless to measure effectiveness. So that's two. Number three, uh, we must not fall back on uh, automated means and to say that AI will solve all of our problems. And four, um, I would like to not hear any more about uh, media literacy for young people. Like we cannot call them digital natives at the same time as trying to provide them with some uh, with, I have not heard of a 14 year old who clicked on you must see this amazing dot com whatever. And also the voting data shows that we should focus on people who are not in that age group actually or have very different exposure to the online um, ecosystem. So these are my four missing okay. pieces at the moment. Thank you, and uh, my two pieces are metadata and the machine readable format. Metadata is because uh, if you can uh, permit uh, to people con creating content more ability to describe what they're creating, this implies that also who receive this data can do a better selection. And that uh, is going to empowering uh, individual in getting uh, what they need and uh, forcing uh, who produce the content to be more responsible. In this moment, uh, we had a news media that uh, looks like uh, any other kind of uh, page that uh, promotes spam or fake content. So you need to have uh, some way to um, enable uh, revision, not just because uh, you are a literate person with uh, eight hours per, per day to do fact checking. We should think that uh, validation of the information uh, would be better if it's embedded in the information itself. This is not happening also because the two monopoly of the information, Facebook and Google, have a strong strength uh, have uh, important um, assets in uh, analyzing uh, natural text and uh, let people uh, to find this text, letting the platform decide in, instead of the, those uh, citizen users. Uh, instead, uh, imagine to a more distributed uh, responsibility, uh, you should have this metadata. And machine readable format are uh, the basic for any kind of interoperability, so the possibility to have a different platform that implement different uh, politics and uh, third-party accountability. Who targets me and ProPublica have issue, like uh, also my extension has some issue, in doing parsing of HTML, because uh, Facebook keeps changing their HTML, and uh, this uh, makes uh, the conflict shift in the tec technical sphere. So I'm catching up because uh, I came from 20 years of hacking, and uh, if you are a journalist or a political scientist, maybe uh, you don't have the same kind of uh, um, knowledge or readiness, but uh, this is not the way we can win. I mean, uh, it's against Facebook. So it's a company that does software and has a dedicated team to avoid this kind of analysis. In general, what we should have as a regulation is enabling third-party um, accountability and third-party monitoring of this platform. Um, I guess that's all. 
what, what I feel is that there is really like multiple aspects that need to be managed and uh, um, which comes from my perspective, uh, like also from a regulatory point of view. Actually, we, um, what, what in your opinion should be the first attack to the piece of legislation? Meaning for like giving you an example, I feel that for example, eventually will be easier to go through electoral law than passing through like uh, disinformation and so on. Um, what, what's your feeling? What will be like for you uh, the first uh, action to, I mean, like in the short terms, we, it's quite clear that European elections are quite out of our scope, eventually just to gather evidence to <laughs> prepare for the next attack. But if you could start from somewhere, like I think that, that was, it's very like connected to the missing uh, discussion, but we have to push for <laughs> safeguard and try to find measure and mechanism. So I, I would really like to see a proactive approach in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the debate and thinking, okay, I believe that this is going to be the next step. That's what we should do now. Difficult. <laughs> Go ahead, um, like it's an uh, open up. I'm asking to the panel, but. <laughs> uh, well, I put down some. Very uh, good, homework. Homework, <laughs> yes. Uh, as I said before, in the short term, I see a role of political parties, uh, some kind of uh, self-regulation uh, uh, to uh, relax a little bit uh, the uh, the, the political, uh, the harshness of the political discourse uh, and uh, to uh, decide for a, I mean, to, to agree to use, uh, for instance, micro-targeting according to some ethical standards, for instance, or to have a, commu a political communication that is Just disclose ethical. that they're doing it, actually, <laughs> will be a beginning. Yes. Um, I see um, that uh, uh, there is, uh, in general, there should be, or we can um, foresee a, a role of uh, media and data protection authorities at the regulatory level. Uh, and of course, they could uh, maybe apply or, or monitor the application of laws that, as I was saying before, ban bots uh, or uh, for instance, ask for um, uh, the disclosure of uh, um, the, um, the, the, the ad political advertising uh, that uh, were uh, funded by political parties. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, um, I mean, from the readings that I've done, that platforms uh, on their hand should uh, uh, guarantee equal economic conditions to the candidates, uh, that it's not always the case. For instance, when, uh, when they compete for the same slot of uh, audience uh, in uh, the same moment, I mean, they, they should uh, um, be granted uh, the same uh, um, uh, economic conditions. In the long term, uh, I see um, somehow in the logic of uh, our project, the pluralism, the media pluralism monitor that uh, tackles and uh, um, tries to understand what are the risks for pluralism uh, based on uh, a set of indicators covering uh, basic protection, uh, the economic aspects uh, of uh, the uh, media land, the, the media market, the media landscape, uh, the political, uh, uh, the, the risks for the political debate uh, and uh, the risks for social inclusion. Uh, in the long term, I see uh, a policy uh, that uh, boosts uh, um, pluralism online, having regard uh, to the economic power of these uh, big companies, given also this economic power that is given also by the, uh, the, their, the, the fact that they have this amount of data, on pers of personal data that is a, an asset that uh, makes them uh, Mm, dominant in, uh, in their in their sure. field uh, mm -hmm. with uh, few possibilities of new entrants to come in the same market. I see a role of, uh, as I said, media and data protection and competition authorities uh, um, uh, coordinated at EU level, if possible, because uh, uh, national authorities can cannot do 
much uh, alone. Uh, of course, uh, the, um, the, the solution that, that everyone says, media literacy, and I would say data literacy, in the sense uh, in the, that uh, somehow was exposed by Claudio, the fact that uh, you should be aware of, of how your data, how your data are used, uh, how the algorithm uses your data. Um, and um, um, I think that uh, there is a big role of research in that, uh, also because I read the, the uh, reports of the authorities, for instance, on these topics, and I see that uh, uh, they are looking for help because really no one has uh, the, uh, the solution uh, or to, to these uh, big and vast problems. Fanny, she wants to take on it. Yeah. I don't want to see short-term solutions. That's yeah. I think that's my answer. Um, uh, Joe McNamee, somewhere here in the hallways, our friend and colleague always says that we need evidence-based policy making, and I think that's what is missing here. We talked about cybersecurity, election interference, intermediary liability, government propaganda, data protection. We all covered this. Yeah. And so I really don't see a short-term solution. I think we should address the underlying business model, why this information is disseminated and generated and consumed and what's happening there. And um, every short-term solution I've seen so far seemed not only inadequate, but also harmful and human rights uh, violating. So I think uh, the next step is actually the, as I said, the evidence-based policy yeah. making. More research, so you basically agree also with the approach of... From the side of the uh, so, so proposed solution, <laughs> this tool uh, is not yet uh, accessible uh, for end user because uh, the first uh, phase of uh, the life uh, has been dedicated for researcher academy and uh, political scientists who are doing analysis. And that is our uh, contribute to evidence-based uh, policy making in the sense that uh, in the moment we analyze the Facebook algorithm like a black box, testing it uh, with a fake profile that were following the same pages that were accessing in the same moment, they were scrolling automatically, and you can assume in theory, if they are treated equally, that we'll get the same information. Instead, because they had different likes, they were getting different information. We start to at least find the matrix to bring evidence and have some means to describe the algorithm. And try to describe with more accountable terms and numbers what Facebook is doing. That is the beginning to let a policymaker at least speak about something that is not a completely abstract concept like the algorithm. <laughs> but something that uh, actually has an impact on uh, your uh, um, information complexity or uh, your information diversity. Because uh, in the moment that uh, you can measure it, uh, you can also start to ask and demand for a more um, so specific uh, evidence again and like information. Josh, would you hands up? Then I will open up the. Yeah, I mean, just thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, yell when you want it back. Um, just briefly, I, I think everyone in the UK um, certainly is holding their breath for the first big GDPR clobbering um, by the ICO. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of confident that it's coming. You know, we have a regulator who um, has handed out kind of fines to the maximum fine to Facebook. They've donned jackets and raided Cambridge Analytica. Um, and when we raised, uh, we, I was able to raise this um, to the information commissioner as an event and she kind of gave me a conspiratorial look and said well it just it's coming um but i think that will be a real test of you know uh, legislation is all very well and good but it's how we enforce it that matters um so i think we're looking forward to that happening now i'm ready to open up to the public for q a so any question i see very like worried faces okay gentlemen down there uh, i'm not sure if you need them yeah can do you think that you can or you need a... Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Thank you. 
testing are uh, basically is run by algorithms. The institutions that they give you are not. They are run by human beings uh, who are generally trying to do their best uh, in a new environment. Uh, I think without like overstating it, I think that the EU is probably ahead of many. Um, I was in the European Parliament this morning and people were comparing um, relatively good access of civil society compared with uh, member state uh, systems and other jurisdictions in the United States. Um, and I think it's pretty basically in the same breath to be regretting populism and then casting aspersions on attempts to find uh, policy solutions through high-level groups. I mean, it's quite easy to mock, uh, but uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a question of uh, particular concern. Um, but I just wanted to have that kind of on the record because. Uh, Thank ne you. The next comment on the record, please, on the microphone, because I'm afraid uh, we'll be only in our memories. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. to answer We're to your question, uh, ah, we oh, collect before just, questions. No, no, just wanted to thanks because uh, we also invited someone from the European Commission. Unfortunately, there were a lot of conferences running today, so they couldn't be here. But of course, like we we appreciate to have also another point of view on the on the topic. Now you can, I think it, uh, there's other question, or maybe you can directly answer to the. Uh, uh, fake profile and dark grids. And uh, yeah, Fanny, if you want to answer yeah. to your comments, you can go ahead. Um, I think what I don't appreciate is the platform's actions more than the, the initiatives. And the problem is that we see self-regulatory attempts failing in many aspects. And I'm afraid that this is just yet another example where we don't see enough progress. We definitely value the individual commitment and work of the European Union's public officials, but as a systematic basis, we don't see that uh, human rights respecting approach would be in the center of that policy making or not enough, at least. Um, and also, Based on, the based on the expert group compositions, my experience is the complete opposite of what you just described about the civil society participation. Usually the compositions are extremely skewed toward business entities, but I'm really happy if there was an event where NGO and nonprofit civil society participation was adequ adequate in, in your view. Um, and uh, just to report back on one element, actually there was a request to make the commitment to strengthen the European Action Service even more. So in that regard, the, the criticism was not enough action for that specific part of the, of the EU institutions. On the question on uh, reverse engineering, uh, this is not really reverse engineering because the variable considered, considered by Facebook are too many. And we cannot really know all of them. And uh, still has been helpful to start to understand, measure the algorithm, see to which extent can really distort the perception of uh, people or profiles that are following the same uh, media sources. Um, just to also um, connect uh, with the uh, funny and the comment, uh, the goal of this uh, algorithm literacy effort is to uh, give more material to policymaker or uh, public society. So, but that's required uh, some years of translation from the technical uh, analysis, etc. Yeah, you can. Thank you, Claudia. Hello. Just a question. The the focus often seems to be Facebook platform, Facebook's platform and then the web browser version, even though we know that that's actually th the thing that people use least, right? People use the app and people use Instagram. And also my favorite favorite part of the Cambridge Analytica scandal was that there were reports, I'm not sure if they have been externally ver verified, that the company also targeted um, articles on political websites, etc. So this entire ecosystem is quite big and I'd love to hear your, what do you think are solutions 
for even measuring um, outside the web browser platform? And, and what kind of exciting initiatives do you see in this area? Who want to take on this? Can you? <laughs> Seems. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, again, uh, is a um, civil society or uh, NGO, small groups uh, of researchers against uh, large companies uh, who need uh, technical resources. If we spread these resources among uh, uh, competitive uh, web, web extension doing the same thing, it's also even harder. Uh, shoot out uh, if Facebook blocks you, maybe it's better if we collaborate. Um, but uh, the mobile should be addressed. Just the mobile platform are uh, more hostile to this kind of investigation. Uh, again, if we have to do a simulation with my own uh, uh, rootkit uh, device, we can do something. But if it's about enabling a uh, um, citizen, that is harder. Ad address platform will be addressed. For example, Twitter and YouTube, they can be addressed in the same approaches, in the sense of understanding, again, how the algorithm is influencing or uh, what is promoting uh, more than something else. The desktop version, uh, the mobile, I mean, technically is possible, but it uh, depends on uh, if should be remain in the uh, researcher hands or uh, in, um, in average people. Natalie mm. maybe had a question before. Oh. No. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Claudio. <laughs> I'm not sure if Josh wants to comment on something. Um, it seems I, like uh, it was. <laughs> just very briefly on that specific question of solutions for measuring um, the kind of wider advertising ecosystem. Um, so there are, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sure you're um, aware that there are approaches that which use the browser as a kind of as a platform, so that you can. Um, we're involved in a process in a project at the moment looking at gambling advertising targeted at young children, which has created a kind of a bunch of fake profiles to browse the net, to collect cookies, to look like kids, and then to see what um, what is being advertised, which starts to get the idea of you know where else online um, advertising is going on, but again, only takes a certain perspective on the problem. Um, and, you know, as you say, there's there's a multiplicity of, of places you can be advertised to. Natalie was mentioned by Claudio. Thank you, I have a great panel cooperating with me. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, so this is a, a factual question that uh, content warning may be upsetting to our British friends and colleagues. Um, Will GDPR still apply in the UK after the, the thing that shall not be named? <laughs> we, uh, who knows? Um, but probably, <laughs> I, we, I think this was raised, and I, I keep coming back to this, but I think um, this was raised in conversation with Elizabeth Denham, and she said, look, we are still going to enforce this. Um, obviously, the problem with being British at the moment is I don't have an answer to any questions like that because yeah, no one does. No, 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 that's, it's quite a right. I, my, my view is that there are a sufficient number of people who care quite deeply about enforcing um, GDPR for it to roll over, but don't take my word on it. Uh, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I will take the like for... Okay, so apparently there is an answer from the public. They will, otherwise, there will be a legal vacuum. <laughs> so it was just say it, it essentially will, and they've also published regulations in the kind of no deal event, which um, have various issues, but it's their attempt to kind of create a UK GDPR, as they call it. Uh, just, just do you? <laughs> like, no? Yeah. Um, well, I, I just want to, to share um, another peculiar situation because even with GDPR uh, in a country of the European Union um, there is a um, political um, uh, party exemption um, and uh, in Romania political parties can process personal data even special categories of uh, personal data uh, just by merely informing the people so GDPR or no GDPR we still have a big issue um, with these kinds of uh, exemptions and uh, this type of abuses that uh, that can emerge. So yeah, what funny, can I you do? You, you mentioned this issue. I just wanted to uh, quickly respond to that. With um, There was an old case in Hungary when um, the government mixed the data available for the state, for the government, as the 
and the party, the governing party, which is very clearly unlawful. And the Data Protection Authority issued a report that said that yes, there is an infringement, but the director of the party, who is obviously a very loyal person to the government, is uh, working on the issue and it will be mitigated. And they did not initiate any following process on that. I mean, this was back a few years ago, but already by the pretty loyal uh, data protection authority. So, I think we are the very moment of closing up, right in time, 45. I thank you for the a rich in discussion. It's not that encouraging, <laughs> but we, what? Closing remarks. <laughs> you are willing to share your closing remarks, so please go ahead, Claudio. <laughs> Well, the best way to do this kind of observation is collaborating. So if you have a, a Facebook profile, you can, instead of a delete Facebook, donate your digital body to science. <laughs> that is a... And provide all the data to Claudia. I also have one about the popul populism and um, solutions to elections. I feel very guilty every day of not quitting and not running for election yeah. at home. I'm from Hungary. I think the only solution if people like anyone in this room would be more interested in politics and take active action. I don't know, don't have a specific closing remark. I just want to, to, to tell that what I mentioned are not solutions, of course, <laughs> but are just uh, small actions that maybe can help uh, understanding uh, how, uh, what kind of direction we could take maybe start and try one, uh, uh, one measure, one regulatory measure, and see whether it works, because uh, we are really in uh, complex times. Uh, I simply have no concluding remarks except to say thank you. It's absolutely fine. Uh, what I've felt from the discussion, it's uh, clearly a need for transparency and uh, to share more information uh, for research and evidence. This is definitely something that will be the base for going forward. Uh, I thank you um, a lot for joining us in this, uh, in this debate. Be more political active. <laughs> Try to control your data. And um, please join me in thanking the great panel we had. Thank you.